Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. This episode is proudly sponsored by Integrity, your partner for life. Integrity recently launched an exclusive research paper to help advisors understand how to attract and retain new clients. They believe their role in the industry is bigger than just providing products. They want to help create a sustainable industry, educate clients, and support advisors personally in their business. You can get a copy of the report and learn more about Integrity if you visit integritylife.com.au forward slash xy. Welcome back to the XY Advisor Podcast. I'm Fraser Jack, and I'm joined from the other side of the world by another Fraser, or Fraser, I should say, Brendan Fraser. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. I got to say, if, if of all people that I've uh, talked to today, you have the best name of anybody uh, that I, that's been on that list. So. Why, thank you. I'm, I'm maybe a little bit biased, if you will, but... <laughs> we definitely bond over our amazing name, don't we? <laughs> yeah, we do. There's no doubt. <laughs> it's the little things in life that get us... <laughs> 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 now, uh, I'm chatting to you today because you're uh, doing a couple of amazing things. Well, firstly, you're running a financial planning business and you focus very much on clients' uh, hopes, dreams, goals, aspirations, values, emotional decision-making factors, which I love and I can talk about that all day. But not only that, you're also doing some work with uh, financial advisors and financial planners um, starting with, uh, and we'll get to this probably towards the end, but starting with, uh, you know, an amazing podcast that you do called The Human Side of Money, uh, and also some uh, speaking and courses and things that you do. So we'll get to that, I guess, in the, in the, in the end. But tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about you, uh, where you're living and, and, and what your financial planning business is at the moment. Yeah. And, and thanks for having me on and saying thanks for calling my work amazing. Sometimes I don't necessarily look at it that way when it's a day to day grind, but I also want to be sure and say, and tell you thanks and say thanks for the work that you do for the community and for advisors and putting out two podcasts a week is certainly no easy task. And so, uh, anyways, it, it doesn't go unnoticed. And I think it's cool. And just wanted to say thanks and thanks for having me on. So I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, um, where I, I've got two businesses. Like you said, I've got my financial planning business and practice that I run, uh, and then a separate business where I get work with coach advisors on what we call the human side of money or the human side of advice. And then I'm just crazy enough that because two businesses isn't enough that I'm married and have two kids that I'm raising as well that are both under three. So not only am I, am I growing and raising two kids, I'm growing and raising two businesses. And there are times where I go to bed at night and I'm wondering, am I crazy? Is this really worth it? But uh, the one thing that keeps you going is when you're truly passionate about something. And I really am passionate, probably oddly so uh, about raising the bar of advice, not just here in the U.S., but but quite frankly, around the world, because I think I think most of us would agree that historically maybe hasn't had the best perception. I guess studies show that the industry hasn't had the best perception. And so the, whatever we can do to raise that, because what we do is I mean, it, it, how many other jobs, how many other professions in, in, can you, in the world can you say can increase somebody's time, money and peace of mind? And there's not many things. Re- how many ways that you can influence all three factors in somebody's life like that? And we have the ability to do that each and every day with our clients. And so we deliver an amazing service. We deliver amazing value to our clients when done right. And so the more we can raise the level of advice, I think the better off everybody's going to be. Yeah, fantastic. I think it was very, very well put, by the way. Uh, t- tell us about uh, your past and history. How did you get into becoming a financial planner? Yeah, so I spent the first about seven years of my career on what we call the wholesaling side of the business. I don't know, you guys may have a different terminology for it, uh, but essentially I was on the product distribution side. So I was consulting with financial advisors around the states on retirement income products and helping kind of consult with them to say, hey, I've got a client, this is their situation. Uh, what What's the best product? What's the best thing that I should put into this portfolio to generate the income that they need. So the cool 
thing about that is you get to it really accelerates your experience because I, not, instead of working with 100 to 200 clients, 300 clients, I was working with thousands of advisors who all, who had their clients. So it's you know it was a lot of repetition as far as getting to see what clients face, what they say, what advisors say, how they run their practices. So it's really a crash course in understanding uh, technical strategies, how clients think and act, and then also how to run a successful advisory business. Um, at the same time, you get a lot of insights into how to not run a successful advisory business, the things not to do when you're working with and, and talking to clients. Uh, and so you see, all, you see the good and the bad. So I spent... First seven years of my life, uh, well, my, not my life, but, but my career <laughs> doing that. Um, and then ultimately just my, my, I think I, A, I didn't want to, I just didn't want to travel anymore because we were having our son. And then B, I always wanted to kind of embrace my entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit and kind of do my own thing, have my own practice and, and firm. So I eventually made the move over and, and started doing my own thing and getting into financial planning and advice and doing it the way that a combination of what I saw that worked well that I thought was the way it should be done. And then making sure I wasn't doing the things that kind of, that, that turned me off that obviously were the things that gave the industry a little bit of a black eye um, and did that. So that's when I decided to make that jump. It was right for, it was right while my wife was pregnant. It required a little bit of a pay cut. So that's what I call the right time fallacy. If you wait for the right time, it'll never happen. There's no such thing. So if you can go to your wife and convince her to, to change jobs and take a pay cut right before you bring a wife into the world, you know, well, you're probably a little bit crazy, mostly. <laughs> but uh, so once I got my the financial planning business kind of at least up and running a little bit, had my feet underneath me, I'd always had a passion for not just financial planning, not just the the, the financial aspect, financial strategies and technical knowledge, but have a, a weird uh, obsession with sort of the the psychology and the behavioral components of why people do what they do and the things they do. And even when they don't make sense, so the, the, the whole idea that you can know exactly what to do in order to get the outcome you want, or you can, you could literally see step-by-step step what to do in order to achieve the goals that you want. And by and large, we're still not able to do them. So you look at, I'll, I'll give some, I don't know the statistics for Australia, but you look in the U S you've got, obesity rates that are higher than they've ever been, marriage failure rates that are hovered around 50% for as long as we can remember, about 90% of, I don't know, let's call it 80%, 90% of businesses that get start up eventually fail. And there, and it's not because we don't, we have a lack of information on how to build a successful business, have a marriage that thrives, um, on how to lose weight and not be obese. It's not an information problem, it's an execution problem. And so, I don't have the numbers for finances, but it probably stands as a reason that if it if it stays true in those realms, that that people's finances probably aren't a whole lot different. So if we're sitting here giving them a financial plan, right, that tells step by step or an investment uh, approach that tells you exactly what to do to get the outcome you want, odds are if you, you can you you can have the perfect plan, but in the absence of execution, it's not really it's not really going to matter. So there's a quote that I heard that's just kind of shaped the way I look at it and was sort of the spark for um, the business where we focus on that, that aspect of the relationship, the human side of money. And it, it's a guy named Derek Sievers. And he says, if all we needed was information, we'd be billionaires with six packs because the reality is we don't just need information. We have all the information that we need. We need the execution. We need to understand what are the things that are getting in our way? What, what are the psychological and behavioral obstacles that we need to overcome to get to where we want to go. And so that's when I decided, you know what, there's this, there's a gap out there. We, we know there's a lot of information and research on behavioral finance and behaviors, even outside of the field of finance that talks about how people behave, the weird ways that they behave. It talks about why they behave that way. So we know, okay, some this lady that's about to retire, she's when the market drops, she's sold out. We know that how she behaved, she did that because it didn't make a lot. She she it didn't make a lot of sense, but, but we know that she did. We know why she did it because she suffers from loss aversion, recency bias, of uh, availability bias. What we need to know is what to do about it, and that's where you kind of start. I, I would hear from these advisors that I was working with. I would ask, you know, what what is it that you do to hone not your technical knowledge, but your knowledge around how to better understand people and then how to actually get them to follow through on your advice. And they'd all say like, well, I mean, I, I don't really do anything. I just 
rely on my, my skill set, rely on my, you know, my, my skills or maybe pick up a thing here or there, but there's never been, I shouldn't say never, but, but, there's not a lot of high quality top notch resources in the industry that exist to help develop the, a skill set not on technical knowledge but on the ability to understand an emotionally charged topic like money and get somebody to change their behavior for the better so that's when that's when i decided you know what i'm going i want to help solve this problem and bridge the gap between education and application like not just knowing why this is happening, but what we as advisors can do about it to improve our clients' outcomes and get them to the goals that they want to achieve. And that's kind of how Wired Planning and then the podcast was born was in pursuit of helping other. I, I figured if I felt this way and all these advisors were telling me they didn't have a way to do it, I thought, you know, what, I'm going to try to help solve the problem and, and let's all learn this together and figure out how to raise the bar of advice doing it that way. Yeah, it's very, very interesting, isn't it? Because I think a lot of uh, when the younger advisors started, when I first started as an advisor, it was very much around, I knew every, you know, what we call a product disclosure statement, you know, which is the, the document that explains the product. Uh, and I knew I knew the wording. I knew how it worked. I knew all these things. And I was uh, very technically, uh, you know, minded. And I could, I could spurt that information out to all of our clients who were bored out of their brain about it. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, right. But yeah, the rest of that sort of stuff that you mentioned, that, that emotional side of money, that tends to come with a lot of experience for a lot of planners. And, and you know, how do you get 30 years experience overnight? It's not that easy. Uh, and yep. I guess the answer to that is you focus on it and fast track it with exactly what the, the sort of thing that you were talking about. Yeah. And I think it's important to say this too. I always try to, it's easy for me to forget sometimes. I, I want to clarify while I'm saying this and talking about the importance of of the human side of money, the emotional side, and being able to master that, that comes with the assumption that you're delivering and giving sound, fundamental, technical advice. So bad advice paired with great human abilities is not good advice. We're talking about kind of taking it to the next level and, and assuming that there's a foundation and a baseline of great advice, sound advice, uh, advice that hel helps people, helps put them in a better position financially. I know some people, I've had some people say like, well, do you just disregard the that aspect of it? And it's like, no, 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 hang on. That's still very much necessary. It's just not sufficient. So I, I think it's, I wanted to kind of yep. yeah, point that's, that out and that, say that's important. That's absolutely fair enough. Uh, now, be, before we get too far into this, tell me about starting your practice. You said starting from scratch by yourself. Does that mean you basically had zero clients? You got your, you got your licensing and registrations and all those sorts of things, uh, qualifications all sorted out, and then you just what opened the door and, and, and tried to bring a couple of new clients in? Or how did you start the first few clients? Yeah, so I was already I already had all the licensing and, and qualifications and training and stuff just to be in the role where I was consulting with advisors on the wholesaling side for all those years. So I had all that. It was basically, yeah, just going out and trying to figure out how to start, how to start my practice. And yeah, that's what I did. I, I went out and I basically started from scratch with, with no clients and had to essentially look there, look at it one day and go, okay, I've got nothing here. And how do I create something from nothing? And I, I'll say this because I know there's probably people listening from all different, um, ranges in their career. I right? like there's maybe some people that are newer a little later on, but for those that are newer, here's one thing that I heard. Again, this is one of those cool things about getting to work with so many advisors and see so many different viewpoints. You you, you hear pretty much everything. So I heard so many times the, these guys and gals, these guys and girls that would say the first three to five years, sometimes longer, is really, really, really hard, right? So you hear about how hard it is to start from scratch, how difficult it is, and you, and you hear it enough that where you truly believe it. You know that it's true, right? Like, well, no, they wouldn't keep saying that if it wasn't true. Kind of like everybody says with kids, like, oh, man, time just flies by. It's like nobody disagrees with that. Everybody says it. Therefore, it has to be true. Well, not only is it true, it's harder than I think any than I even imagined. So it's one thing to know it. It's another thing to go through it and experience it. Um, and I just kind of wanted this. I think sometimes you listen to people talk about their businesses and their practices and how they did X amount in so many years. And, and those people, I think you tend to hear about because they've been so successful. And, and like, I, I've been fortunate, don't get me wrong, but I, I, I sometimes wonder, like, are we making it sound a little bit too easy and glossing over the fact that people say it's some of the hardest, toughest years of your life, because it actually is some of the hardest, toughest years of your life. And it's just a matter of 
basically, I mean, what it, being persistent and surviving and coming out the other side to reap the rewards later. Yeah, absolutely. It's like uh, it's like a, a a long distance race or whatever it might be. It hurts. Uh, it's, you feel like giving up at times, uh, but if you just keep putting one foot in front of the other, you end up uh, getting towards the finish line. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's not not an easy task. How how did you physically go about it? How did you pick up your first couple of clients? Was it just you know you people you knew or friends of friends or how did you sort of market yourself as a, a new financial planner? So believe it or not, um, I started with a firm here for a variety of reasons that where I was the initial firm that I started with, it was it's called Edward Jones. And it basically was the easiest bridge financially to get where I was where I wanted to be, like to be able to open a practice. Um but essentially, they have this model where they they built it out to where you go door to door to people's houses to introduce yourself, get to know people in the community, and kind of go about it that way. Now, naturally, yeah, I definitely had my uh, friends and family that I reach out to, but I also kind of had this mindset of if I just focus on friends and family, I'm never going to make it. I don't have enough friends and family to truly survive, like I mean, or to truly thrive. Like maybe they can help me get by, uh, but if that's what I focus on, like I'm not going to make it. So. Um, not only that, but I also kind of have this, this working theory that I've come to believe where I, I don't know that people should be work, serving their families. Certain scenarios, yes. A lot of scenarios, no. But that's another topic for another time. Um, so that's how I kind of started. That was a grind. You can't scale very well that way. So I switched to a firm where uh, I had more capabilities to uh, like more, um, I wasn't as restricted as far as what we could do from a compliance standpoint. It allowed me to to niche down a little bit further. It allowed me to broadcast my message into certain markets. So anyway, so I decided to, to pivot it uh, into working with financial or sorry, working with uh, parents that are entrepreneurs and business owners. So now I do the planning for entrepreneurial parents and business owners and yeah, and that's where you really start seeing the value. Uh, and I think this has become a popular topic more so lately too. You'll hear across the industry, but uh, it's become a little bit more common or it's be- you're starting to see the value of niching and honing in um, the industry shifting to where a lot of this advice is commoditized. There's a, a lot of value in niching and going deep. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, I went from literally going from one person's door to the next to introduce myself. Uh, to, and that was fine, but it, it wasn't going to get me where I wanted to go. Uh, to realizing, hey, this, this isn't the way to do it. The way to do it is to just truly specialize and serve people that you enjoy working with. Um, and then, then everything happens a lot faster that way. Yeah, exactly. And uh, we went through a lot of conversations over the years and on some recent podcasts actually around the conversation around niching, niche, niching or we call it niching here, uh, 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 but, but using the word specializing because, uh, you know, as, as we move towards, a, you, know, bec- you know, calling ourselves a profession, uh, there's always been specialists in other professions and those specialists have often been around a particular uh, topic or subject or, um, you know, you've got your brain surgeons which specialize in brain surgery, um, but instead of specializing in different product sets, we thought, well, actually, you know what? Specializing in different client types is is also a specialization. And I guess you went from specializing in people who live in this local neighborhood to uh, to a, a people that are very much like you when it comes to you know entrepreneurial and you know family, young families, or or, or, or juggling the two. Um, so you get and understand what all those different pain points around that are. So. Yeah, that was, yeah. Uh, that was a probably good part. And so then you started that business up. You you then were able to then find those businesses, I guess, not necessarily in the same neighborhood, but anywhere around uh, around the local area. Yeah, and and one of the things that's been eye opening too is there's been a much a bit, at least especially as I've been ramping up, I've had a lot more interest locally, right? So like, you know, people, it's, there's some, still something to be said for knowing that somebody's nearby or you have this common connection of, oh, he's in Nashville. Okay. Well, I'm down the street. So you, there's a natural inherent connection and level of trust just simply by living in the same area of the country. Whereas if I, I could have, you could have one, uh, you could have a business here in Nashville that's run by a parent that, uh, that they're, they're my, let's say ideal, perfect client. You could have that same identical business in, in San Francisco, California, which is for you know literally uh, a, a couple days trip from here, so not close at all. And there's no reason why one would maybe be a little bit more willing to work with me than another. Like as far as the service provided, the way we can help, the value we add, it's literally identical. There, but there's still something to be said, probably just based on human nature and and, and how we've evolved. And it, there's something to be said for 
proximity and local proximity and just feeling a little bit more of a connection. So I've tried to leverage that too, to say like, all right, I, I doesn't, there's nothing stopping me from going outside of Nashville. I think ultimately long-term and we've seen recently a little bit more interest from, uh, you know, businesses, uh, nationwide, uh, mainly from referrals. Um, but it, ultimately I think what we're going to see is if you are truly, truly great at what you do and the market that you serve, the market that you specialize in, and I, actually, I'll say this, we've already seen this. If you're truly great at what you do in the market you specialize in, geography, the boundary of geography is going to start, the walls are going to be, they're going to be broken down, right? You're going to see the barriers reduce and a lot more that's going to go on. And we've already seen it some ourselves, but there will always be, I still think there's always going to be something to be said for proximity and how we naturally feel emotionally closer to somebody that's still physically closer. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. It's sort of the um, the difference between online meetings and, and meetings in, in, in the same room uh, or, you know, where you, you can physically sh- shake hands at that distance, that proximity. Uh, we, I think, we, I think we, we as humans develop trust faster in that zone because somebody's inside you, well, it can get inside your personal space and they're still not going to kill you. Therefore, you, they, all, automatically they've got one tick of trust. Um, but I think, I think definitely, as you mentioned, online or like, like we're talking now is – is a possibility for, or well, it's definitely a, 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 something that a lot of businesses do, but it's also something that um, just takes a little bit longer without without that proximity. Yeah, no, I think you're right, and I, th- I think once the compliance walls start coming down too, and you can start doing more things digitally through social media, through your website, like that's where it really becomes an, an opportunity, and, and things can kind of you can unleash your business without geography at that point. Um, yep. but so, I mean, yeah, I think it's certainly the direction we're headed now. That being said, I just want everybody to know that I certainly feel, despite the fact that we're in separate countries, I still feel close to you. So. Oh, th- thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And uh, for yeah. everybody listening, we're in their ears. So we're, we're definitely close to them as well. Um, now tell us about, uh, tell us about the well, inside your business. Cause obviously, you know, we're talking, you know, sound financial planning strategies and, and those sorts of things, but we're, then you also do a lot of work with your clients or, or around the concept of, as you said before, implementing and actually going forth and having ownership in, in the plans and, and taking them on board and having that emotional, um, the, 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 bit, the bit that's between their ears, I guess, uh, being emotionally involved in, in the plan. How do you work practically work with your clients on that? Yeah, I mean, there's that's probably a whole conversation in and of itself, just the different ways in which we can implement that, the different things that we do or make sure that we do in conversations, uh, both it, both with clients, but also systematically and processes. Um, yeah, I guess I'll maybe I'll answer it this way. Instead of saying like these are all the things that we do, the things that you hear most often, the, the, the questions I get most often from advisors are around like, hey, how do I remove friction in certain parts of the process? Or how can I create a client that's more emotionally connected? Because emotionally connected clients, not satisfied clients, but emotionally connected clients are shown to buy more often, refer more, they follow through on your advice, um, and they're more willing to consolidate assets. So the, the question kind of becomes, how can we create these emotionally connected clients that don't have as much friction in the process? When I ask them to give me documents, maybe there's not as much, it doesn't take two months instead it takes a couple weeks or, or um, how can I, how do I go about establishing a level of trust and credibility in a first meeting? And what are the best ways to do that? Because I, I was, I said this the other day to somebody that, and truly believe this, that the first meeting with a prospective client has more impact on their financial success and the success of your business than any other meeting you'll ever have with them. Because that's the meeting where you're truly giving them, they're coming, they're walking into that meeting, the prospective clients walking into that meeting thinking, I want to know the answer to questions. Do I, can I like, do I like, and can I trust this person? That's all actually one question. And then do I feel the certainty that they will give me the peace of mind I need to get to where I want to go? So do I like and trust them? And do I feel certain that they're going to give me the peace of mind that I need? And so if you if you miss on that, if you miss on either one of those things, not only are they going to be set back, but you're not you're missing the chance to convert that person into a into a lifelong client. 
And so when we were talking about this is, I guess this is one the, where we usually start as far in our business, but then also when we're working with advisors is in that first meeting, because that's a lot of times where things really get going. And one of the most important things you can do, one of the best things you can do, and, and you know, you can talk to people that are experts in this field. You can talk to advisors that have done this. You can do it yourself and you'll instantly see the results. It's not groundbreaking. It's just hard to do. And that is ask great questions and listen really, really well with empathy and curiosity. So as far as the listening part goes, there's studies out there that show that if you, when, when you're listening and letting somebody else talk about themselves, it lies in the same areas of the brain as when you're eating chocolate and engaging in sexual activity. So assuming that you like both of those things, then you, really, you know that that's a good thing. So that instantly creates a level of likability you can't get otherwise. And then uh, Moira Summers, Dr. Moira Summers, who we've had on the show, who does great work around how to deliver advice that sticks, as she calls it, or that people follow through on. She's either, she's found the research that shows that the the amount of airtime that a prospective client gets in a first meeting is directly related to the satisfaction they feel after that meeting. So the amount of airtime they get directly related to the amount of satisfaction they get. Uh, and so we always tell, we have a rule and we, we work with advisors on this rule that says, strive for a 90-10 talk ratio, sure, or listen, talk, listen ratio. So let them talk 90% of the time, you talk 10% of the time, because what's probably naturally going to happen is if you strive for 90-10, you're going to land closer to 80-20 or 70-30, which is actually a good ratio. Like you, you can't just let them talk the whole time. I'm, and then they're sitting there going, okay, who is that again? And, and why do I trust him? So you have to incorporate you, you, know, you your brand, your personality, what you do. Uh, but if you strive for 90, 10, you're likely, because it's so unnatural, you're likely going to land closer to 80, 20 and 70, 30, which is almost an ideal range. So that's number one, just getting really, really good, really, really great at listening, listening with curiosity, limp listening with empathy. And the second thing is the, the questions that you ask might be the most influential thing that you can do. So there's there's a Harvard Business Review article that that uh, cited a study where they went out and they had two groups of people basically engage in a first conversation. They each were given uh, 15 minutes. And in that 15 minutes, one group was instructed to ask at least nine questions to the person they were talking to. The other person was instructed to ask no more than four questions. So you've got 15 minutes, nine questions for one group, four questions for the other group. And at the end of that time, when they compiled all the results, not surprisingly, the group that was had to ask nine questions was reported as being more well-liked, more well-heard, and then the, they, the partner felt like that person knew a lot more about them. So if you're thinking about sitting there in a meeting with a first, in a meeting with a prospective client, they want to be liked, they want to be heard, and they want to know that you care about them. And one of the best ways to do that is to ask questions, but not just any questions, right? Not just saying like, so what's your weekend plan look like? Or what do you think about our investment strategy? But questions that they've likely never been asked before, right? Or, or questions that get them to start thinking about things that they've never thought about before when it comes to money. In fact, I think one of the biggest compliments you can get when it comes to how well you've done with listening and asking questions is hearing one of two things. One would be, that's a great question. I've never heard that before. That's an immediate, like, uh, uh, an immediate signal, an immediate sign that, hey, that's a good question. If they've never asked it, been asked it before, that's a good question. And then two is that this is maybe the ultimate compliment. And that is somebody finishes a conversation with you and they say, man, I feel so bad. I feel like I just talked your ear off. or I feel like I didn't even let you say anything. And that if you can get one of those two things, you, basically, they're, you know that they're going to end up signing on the dotted line because you've God, you've done something that 99% of your competition and other advisors simply don't do. And that's give them the time and the space to think about money in a way they've never thought about it and guiding them with the questions that they've never thought about before. Yeah, very, very good. Thank you. And so with these questions, are you um, encouraging people to sort of really get deep into sort of the emotional side of things as well? At that point, are you saying, you know, how do you feel about this? Is it... um what you know have you ever thought of this or is it like how, how deep are we going yeah good question uh see good question 
Yeah, it's a kind of a fine balance because obviously at the end of the day, you need to know about their money situation, right? You need to know, you know what their income looks like, what money they have, what their investments look like. You have to know all those things in order to help get them to where they go. It's kind of like before you can lose weight or before you can get in peak shape, you need to first take inventory of where you're at today and know like how, somebody, the, a personal trainer would need to know like, okay, where, how much do you weigh today? What does your diet look like? What are you eating? How often are you working out? You still have to get to those things. But ultimately where the bulk of that, the first conversation sits or focuses is on helping them clearly define and vividly describe their values, their visions, and their goals. Because, because first of all, that's what people want to talk about. And a lot of them, you're pushing them to a place where they've never been before. But it's once you crystallize and really get vivid with your vision and your values that you start getting the motivation that you need to, to push forward and to do this planning or this investment, this, these, this investment uh, plan that you need to do you, the portfolio you need to get to put together. You, it, it helps prompt behavior. It helps move them and motivate them in that direction. When they've got this vision of being able to retire and spend two vacations a year with their grandkids at their and, and, and at their favorite theme park, whether it's you know here, here it'd be Disney World for example, staying in these specific hotels, going out to eat at the restaurants. The more vivid you get, the more fire, the more fuel is put on the fire, if you will. So yeah, that, I mean, that's where a lot of this time is spent is asking the questions to get them there. Now, that being said, that it's also important. A lot of times when, when we're meeting with clients, or you're having a, a, a first meeting with a prospective client, you likely didn't wake up that morning or, or go to bed the night before thinking, before they reached out to you thinking, you know what, I really need to talk to somebody tomorrow about getting a holistic, comprehensive financial plan, like, right? Like a lot of times there's some sort of issue. There's some moment, there's an event that's prompted this. So you obviously want to ask a question to kind of identify or, or diagnose their situation as it stands. So that the question there that, you, that, that I like that I've seen work well, you'll hear other experts talk about is asking something along the lines of if, if we were to look out three years from today, so let's call it May 11th, uh, 2024. And using a specific date is powerful, by the way. So let, let's say it's three years from today. It's May 11th, 2024. What would need to happen between now and then for you to accomplish what you wanted to accomplish, for you to have felt like this was well worth it and a valuable use of your time? And, and you can ask and said, you could say, what brings you in today? And I mean, I think that ultimately gets to the bottom of it too. But I think that that identify and, and help somebody clarify their values and their vision, like the, the kinders three questions, if you're familiar with those, um, a question sort of that goes to the point of, hey, let's assume that you had $20 million in the in your bank account tomorrow. How would you spend it? What would you do with it? The questions that get people to to unlimit or to, to take off the shackles, to unhinge themselves, to think in a way they've never thought. That doesn't mean that you know that you're going to be able to go and provide them the ability to fly around the world on a private jet. But most people can't think past anything other than, oh, if I had twenty million dollars, I'd pay off my debt, my mortgage. Um, I'd probably like get a new car and, and maybe pay off my student loans or my, pay off my kids' student loans. It's like I get that; those are all well and good, but Let's get to what's really important to you. What would you actually do? And then you throw on top of that, what if you had $20 million, but only 10 years to live? Well, how would that change things? Now, all of a sudden, you're forcing, you're, you're basically, you're battling against this idea that we have forever. We have time on our side. We can discount the future and thrusting them into the present to really start prioritizing the things that are important in their lives and aligning the money with what's important to them. And the more you can do that and have those conversations, you're going to have establish a level of trust. You're going to establish likability. You're going to you're going to create the vision that that person wants in a way that most other people just simply won't do. Now, I will say this: the order in which you structure your questions is pretty crucial because what you don't want to do is have somebody walk in, say, "Hey, good, great to meet you. Glad we're finally here." Now, tell me, if you only had ten years left to live. What would you do? How would your life look different? I mean, there you got to be you got to be intentional with how uh, getting there and getting to the point where you can ask that type of question, right? But once you do that, once you once you've done it a few times, that you'll start seeing your conversations take shape, uh, take a, a form and rise to a level that they usually that they've probably never been before. Uh, and then I'll just I'm going to add this last piece because I think it's crucial too. And we're talking to advisors that want to know like, hey, how do I do this? How do I get better at it? 
it's important to know that just like anything, this is not going to be groundbreaking novel uh, information, and it's not what people want to hear, but it's important. And that is you have to practice. The only way you're going to get better is if you practice. So it could be with somebody on your staff. It could be with your, your spouse. It could be with a good friend. But if you're just truly list, if you think of a question that you like and you truly just go into your next meeting with a client and say it for the first time, I can promise you, I can assure you, it's not going to go the way <laughs> that you want it to go. It, it, and that is, that goes especially for the listening piece. I mean, to truly get good at listening, to truly be able to sit in an awkward silence and pause and not interrupt. Is a, it's truly a skill set that has to be honed. So George Kinder's also he, he, famous for saying that uh, they found that two interruptions pretty much loses the person person's interest. So if you interrupt twice in one meet in one conversation, you've pretty much lost them. And it's it's if you if you go back and watch yourself on video, if you record your conversations or have a third party sit in, I'm I imagine what you'll find is you're not near as good at listening as you think you are. You probably interrupt a lot more. Don't listen. You'll if you go back and listen to conversations, you'll hear things that you missed because you're not thinking about what they're saying. You're thinking about what you're going to say next. And so the, it's not fun. It's not easy advice. But the only thing you can do to actually get better at it is to work on it and practice. Yeah, I, I actually agree. And I think um, I think you nailed it before when you talked about the idea of around um, questions, you know, empathy and curiosity um, and just asking, maybe just having the first question and then listening to that, listening to the answer, pausing, showing it some empathy, then being curious with the next question rather than having too many uh, structured questions. Um, now for people that are, uh, thinking about doing this, and obviously there is a, there is kind of like of some, sometimes there's mental barriers in people's heads where they go, Oh yeah, but there's a reason why I'm, that may not work for me, blah, blah, blah. How has it worked for you and your clients? How have your clients reacted to it? Yeah. I want to, I'll add on to something you said a second ago too, which is to, to fuel the curiosity part or to fulfill the curiosity part. And that same, article research study I mentioned earlier where they did the two groups and asked nine questions and four questions. There's another study that was a part of that where they they looked at follow-up questions or in other words, like asking questions about something that the person had said. So they may say something like, uh, yeah, I think for us, it's important to retire and spend some time at the beach. And then instead of just leaving it at that, saying something along the lines of, okay, uh, 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 really, that's really interesting. That's That's pretty cool to hear. What would you do at the beach? Oh, really? Okay. Wait. So I'm kind of curious who would be there with you. And then uh, what follow up questions do is they signal to the other person that you genuinely care about what they have to say. And we've all been there in a conversation ourselves. So if you say something and there's no follow up question to it, you're kind of wondering, like, did they, did they care? Did that like, did that matter to him? But if somebody, if you tell somebody something and the first thing they do is ask for clarification on it, it's an immediate signal that, wait a minute. That person cares about me and it gives me the freedom now to talk more openly from that point moving forward. So I would say that that's an important piece of it too. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so for me, I've seen really the biggest difference with co client conversations and doing this intentionally. I used to be kind of unstructured about it. Just thought, like, oh, good question is a good way to go. I'll just have an arsenal of questions that I'll pull when I want to, when I need to. And it took a, I didn't, so why I'm preaching practice is because that's not what I did at first. I kind of just winged it. And the, what I've found is that as I've gotten more comfortable asking the questions and, and knowing the questions I was going to ask, it frees me up mentally to listen better. And what it does, what it's allowed me to do is spend more time get, in getting that person to tell me the emotional things that they don't really tell anybody else in their life, right? Like how often there's somebody laying out their hopes and dreams to somebody and talking about their fears on a, on a regular basis. It doesn't happen very often. I mean, most people won't do that with their best friend and a bottle of wine, right? So if you can do that in your conversation and get them to open up that way, yeah, I mean, it, the, the biggest thing is you start seeing people tell you things that you're kind of going, I can't believe they're really telling me that, but that's a good sign, number one. But more than anything, the biggest difference I've seen it make is everything else after that, as far as like the sales cycle or the process goes, becomes a lot easier because when you go and start presenting or proposing how you can work with them in your services and what you're going to do, if you say, hey, I've got this great 
uh, strategy, this great financial plan, this great investment that's going to grow your money, that's going to help you protect your wealth. It's, that's one thing. But if you can say, if you can tie their values and their vision to what you're doing, if you can bring that your financial plan to life by, t- by saying, here's this plan, here are the things we recommend that you do, because this is how you'll be able to travel to Disney World and stay in the Swan of Dolphin and eat at these restaurants with your grandkids twice a year like you always wanted to do. Well, you're, you don't get a whole lot of pushback as far as wanting somebody wanting to work with you when you've aligned their, their, the, the strategies and the service you provide with the life that they want. Yeah. And as you mentioned earlier, the, 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 the best financial plans are the ones that are implemented uh, and followed and actioned. Uh, and this is the motivation, isn't it? That's, that's the key to the motivation to get the clients to, to, um, to do what they were going to do and, and to, to, like you said, become emotionally connected uh, with the plan. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. That's a great point as far as like thinking about the different parts of the process where there's friction and there's barriers and, and getting people to actually follow through. There's not, nothing There's nothing that increases motivation and decreases barriers like giving somebody a clear path to the, to the vision that they've vividly described for you. I mean, there's really no better way to do it than that. You can, you can try to design your systems in a way that are less, that have less friction. You can try to like, you know, implement these psychological principles to try to reduce friction. But that's what we found. What I've heard other people say too, is, is probably the single most influential thing you can do to spur action or ignite behavior change in the direction that not only do you want them to go, but they need to go for their own well-being. Yeah, fantastic. Now, um, so that's uh, so so that's the financial planning business side of it. Now, the uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the uh, the you know the human side of money, po- the podcast side of it, uh, that, of the of the entrepreneurial work that you do. Uh, so let's start there, and then we'll sort of talk a little bit about um, what you're doing in that space as well with financial planners. Yeah, just about you want to hear about what we're kind of what we're doing, what the vision is. Yeah, let's start with the podcast. Tell, tell me about the podcast. Why did you start that? Let's talk about uh, obviously that people are listening to this. They might also want to jump over and have, and have a listen to the Human Side of Money podcast. Yeah, it really started from what I mentioned earlier, which is this desire to help bridge the gap between the knowledge that existed around behavior and behavioral finance and psychology and communication, and then how to help advisors understand it, but not just understand it, actually apply it in conversations, in their processes, in their systems. And so what I realized is, A, I was always driving around or walking around with an AirPod in my ear and a podcast on. That's how I I come to digest and learn a lot of my information. Uh, So I thought, you know what? There's people out there that have this knowledge, that know the words to say, the questions to ask, the behavioral strategies to get people to move in the right direction. I don't have all of those answers, right? But there's people out there that do. I could, I could, you know, go to them and ask, have a personal conversation with them to try to draw this information from them, or I could just have the conversation with them and put it out there for everybody to hear. And you'll hear people talk in this, you know, and, and you know this, I'm too, I'm sure too, but you'll hear people say like, I basically just tried to do what. I, I tried to build what I wanted that didn't already exist. So I kept thinking like, I wish somebody would have a guest on that would tell me how to actually get information out of somebody when they're kind of closed off or what nonverbal communication to look for, or how can I apply psychological and behavioral principles to get more referrals? Hey, you know, just not just this, I, the, the, the information itself, but like, the direct application of it to how, so I can go back into the office the next day and use it when I'm talking with, with people. Uh, so that's pretty much what I did. I just thought, you know what, there's a lot of really cool, really smart, really bright uh, people out there that have the knowledge. So let's just, we'll have them on, we'll have conversations with them and have them teach us what we need to do with it to get better outcomes for clients. So they change their behavior for the better, but then also how to change the trajectory of your business from a growth standpoint for the better. Yeah, one of the thing I, things I love about hosting a podcast is you get to get all the information as well. It's not just uh, yeah, 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 right. <laughs> you, get, yeah. you get to be part of these and asking the really great questions, and then and then learning and growing yourself more than uh, more than more than anyone really, I guess. Um, so yeah, yeah. The, the conversations are amazing, and and you're right, you reach out to some pretty amazing people that you you know you may not have thought to reach out to before, and sort of pushes you a little bit harder to find or to to to, to start conversations with these great people, and it turns out that uh, you know. 
they're great humans and they want to be part of it and uh, and they and they're the ones that are willing to give you all this information so that's sort of a really a bonus of being a podcast host no doubt about it. I, I joke with people all the time and say, like, these people that I've had on the show, first of all, like, it's kind of unbelievable to me that I've had conversations with the people that I have. And, and, but, but what I've, what I joked about from the beginning was at the very least, if I was to reach out to a number of these people and, you know, like George Kinder and Brian Portnoy and Sarah Newcomb and, and, you know, pretty much almost everybody I've had on at this point's kind of been like a wow. If I was to reach out to him and say, hey, do you want to have like an hour conversation just talking about the industry and, and behavior and psychology and, and kind of help me get better at my practice? Like, yeah, they, they're all really great people, really nice people. And they probably say, Brendan, no offense to you, but you know, I can't do that. But if you have them, if you have them come on onto a podcast, they'll, they'll give you their time. And then the cool thing is not only do I get to talk to them and, and learn from them, but people around the world are getting to learn from them. Yeah, so definitely, uh, definitely check out that podcast if you, if, uh, if if for anyone out there that wants to ha- have a listen to some really amazing speakers. Uh, speaking of speakers, wh- wh- tell us about what you're doing as well, uh, or after, or on from this. What's the next thing for you? Yeah, so I'm, I'm yeah, you know, continuing to hone in and, and really grow, like lean and mean as far as my financial planning practice goes, uh, and, and plan on always having that be that'll always be an element of what I do, uh, because I think it allows me to stay in tune and in touch with what it's like to be with somebody to, it's one thing to, again, it kind of like the knowing and doing thing. It's one thing to know that the first five years is really, really hard. It's another thing to actually do it. It's one thing to kind of know conceptually what probably resonates with clients. And it's another thing to actually do it. So I always want to have that, um, foot in the toe in the water, if you will. Uh, but at the same time where I really find, I get the most passion and the most energy is working with advisors just simply from the fact that like I can work with you know probably a hundred people and not feel stretched too thin, but I, and I can work with a hundred people and impact a hundred lives and families. But it's, it's what I enjoy at the thought of is thinking about the fact that, uh, and, and getting a message from somebody on the other side of the world saying, Hey, Thanks for the thanks for what you're doing. You're impacting somebody's life and career over here, and then not just that person's life, but then if they have a hundred clients or two hundred clients or three hundred clients, the reach and the ability to impact is, I mean, well, it's exponential, right? So um, that that's where I'm. The my efforts are starting to focus a little bit more. So now, now that the podcast has started gaining traction and taking off, like like I kind of hoped that it would, but you know, you never know. Um, and then, so there's been some, I'm starting to do some speaking engagements on, on the human side of money and the human side of advice and how to apply behavior and psychology and that sort of thing. Um, and then we've got some more in the works of beta testing and, and building out uh, a coaching program, both one that's a little bit more um, hands-on, more coaching oriented, and another one that's uh, more of a course oriented program where you, it's a little bit, it's self-paced. You can go through the courses, their videos with a handheld, a handholding component to it too, but, uh, or a coaching component to it too, but it's a little bit less time intensive and self-paced. So that's kind of the, um, that's the future as it stands. And then the, the last leg of that, that we were talking a little bit about pre-show is I do have a vision of you and I both like the idea of community. And I think honestly, I think communities where real change, real progress is ignited and happens. And so I know I, whenever I set out, um, to launch the show, to start the business, and I figured there were probably other people out there around the world who, who also thought or felt, you know, it's really important for me to understand what goes on in my client's mind when it comes to money, to be able to understand their psychology and behavior, to change their behavior for the better, to help them unearth their values around money. I figured there were probably other people out there that felt that way, that wanted more information around it. What I didn't realize was how many people are out there thinking, I do think this is valuable. I do want this information. I've just never really known where to go to get it. And so... It's been really cool uh, to see that come to life and to know that there is a, people around the world that want that. So I, I have a vision as well of putting together uh, a community-based event and maybe even a community-based platform where those of us who are passionate about that, who are like-minded in that regard, who see the value in it, can collaborate with others that feel that way and think that same way. Because I mean, you know, that's, that's where, like I said, real change happens. Real progress happens is when you're able to have the synergy to share ideas, to talk to other people about what they're doing, to ask other people what questions they're asking, how they're, what they're doing to, to get people 
to, to go through the process with the least amount of friction and the most motivation and um, the stories that they're telling somebody that, that most resonate. Anyways, that's kind of the, that's the next evolution at some point in the future as well. But uh, the one thing I've learned uh, that I, over the course of time that I've learned, but especially since starting two businesses is that, that everything takes longer than you want it to. That's really what it boils down to is that I wish I could snap my fingers. It would happen tomorrow. Unfortunately to do it well and do it right. Just takes a little bit longer than that. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to seeing how that uh, event style or groups might take place, whether it's uh, online or local areas, I guess it's difficult with people all around the world and uh, travel a little bit difficult at the moment, but yeah, that's right. But uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how that takes form. But uh, I, I definitely agree that, um, you know, we can all sort of find people around the world that can bond over a certain uh, thing or topic or, or outcome. And then you can all just work together to help each other, um, you know, participate and get involved and, 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 and share what you know and be involved in that sort of way. And, and you end up creating these, uh, as, as I've spoken about before, like these lifelong relationships. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, it, it's a it's a powerful thing. There's There's no doubt about it. Fantastic. Now, Brendan, if somebody wants to continue the conversation with you, what's the best way for them to find you or, or, or get hold of you, have a chat to you? Yeah. the I mean, I'm pretty active on um, social media. I don't respond immediately. I, as I told somebody the other day, my responses are immediate, but my response rate is pretty good. Uh, so you can reach out on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Uh, just go look up Brendan Frazier um, on one of those two. Or you can – I, I like – I. I like getting emails. I read every email that I get. It may take me a little while, uh, but I'll read all the emails because I think that's where I get the best feedback and learn the most is hearing from advisors and what they're saying, what they want to know. Uh, so you can email me too. It's Brendan Fraser, B R E N D A N F R A Z I E R, spelled incorrectly. Uh, but <laughs> spelled right at, for you. Just different. Yeah, than right. Me. That's right. <laughs> uh, at, at wiredplanning.com. You can go to the website, wiredplanning.com. It's on there too. Uh, yeah. And then if, you, if you're if you interested in listening to the show, it's called The Human Side of Money. Um, there's also a link to it on the website. So uh, yeah, feel free to reach out, follow us in whatever way you want. Or uh, that's, like I said, that's where I learn the most. And that's how we really create, develop, and, and put out the content is based on what we think is most beneficial, what we think people want to know that will benefit them the most. Fantastic. Uh, Brendan, thanks for coming on the the, uh, the show and, and chatting to us today and, and sharing uh, some of your wisdom. Obviously, it goes away deeper and we could, as, as we sort of said, we could we could speak for days on this in this topic. So uh, probably best we don't on one podcast episode. But uh, look, thanks so much for coming and sharing. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It was a, it was a blast. I really enjoyed it. Well, there you have it, another episode of the X5 Advisor Podcast. I'm Fraser Jack, and I'm joined by Emily Blanche. G'day, Emily. Hey, Fraser. How's it going? Tremendous, thank you. Appreciate you asking. It's our uh, favourite time of the week, and we get to do some shout-outs. So who shall we shout-out to today? Yes, I want to give a shout-out to XY Advisor Jaden Post. So had Taborjan Rasaya on this week's XY Plus web event talking about purpose-driven advice, and we got discussing deep questions like when you go really deep in unpacking your clients uh, values and purpose in life and there was plenty of questions plenty of great commentary coming through in the chat box and Jaden actually shared a pdf full of questions that he uses as a bit of a bible maybe and plucks out the ones that are most relevant when he is having discovery meetings with new clients so massive shout out to Jaden for sharing that I had a read through there's some fabulous questions in there we are going to make sure it's available in the resources center in the pre and discovery meeting section so you can jump in there on the platform download it use it and draw some inspiration from it so thanks Jaden legend 